Hello and welcome to another episode of the Master Mind, Body, and Spirit Show. I'm your host, Matt Belair. Today's guest is an independent naturalist, thought leader, and author whose research explores the mythological connections and biological knowledge among prehistoric, indigenous, and ancient peoples. His works in these areas include Biological Time and Before Orion, Finding the Face of the Hero. He proposes that select cave paintings and fundamental pieces in the human journey to self-realization, the foundation of written language and a record of biological knowledge that irrevocably impacted some of the artistic styles, religious practices, and stories that are still with us. His work will change the idea of who you think you are. Welcome back to the show, Bernie Taylor. Matt, thanks for having me on again. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's so good to have you back on. You know, the second that we did our last one, I got so many YouTube comments, and I, I don't know if people reached out to you, but they were so fascinated uh, by the research. And I think one of the comments was just like, my mind is blown, but not in the good way. And so um, <laughs> your research was great. And so it's so great to, to have you back on to explore the mind of Picasso. But it's okay. It's okay that the mind is blown and not in the good way because we're testing, we're challenging you. We're testing the possibilities. We're, we're looking at the world in a new way or perhaps an old way. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so, you know, I guess I'll, I'll let you do a little bit of background just if people are just checking out this show for the first time for the immense amount of research that you've done. Mm -hmm. Um, So give them a little bit of background on, on, who you are and how you came to these conclusions and how old this cave art actually is because it's, it's astounding. We're going to go into a different cave, different caves today than we did in the previous session. And your viewers can go back to the previous video to learn how the apprentice walks into the cave and he's challenged with the red disc and behind those red discs, he finds um, an elephant and um, a horse and all these other characters. Um, and it's really a test of the individual. Can they see, the forest, the trees. And we're going to take that a step further today. And we're going to, the next level of the journey of the apprentice. And we're going to look at through the mind of Picasso. And Picasso is a very important character in modern times because he was, he created modern art. There was no modern art before Picasso. And it was one painting that we're going to talk to fairly soon. But I'm going to tell you how I, I walked into the road of Picasso because I was not a Picasso follower. I wasn't a fan. I wasn't really an art history buffer, anything like that. But it really went down to um, another Paleolithic image that I was studying. And this is the image it's called the Gorm etching in Gibraltar from 36,000 years ago. So we're talking a long time. And this image was very, very famous. It was it was uh, released to the public about five years ago, and it was described as the first abstract art of Neanderthals. Okay, and uh, very controversial. Some people said, "Well, you know, who's, how do you prove it's Neanderthals? They were Homo sapiens in in Iberian Peninsula thirty six thousand years ago." Went back and forth, and kind of the Neanderthal thing got uh, ditched. Okay, but it still became this abstract art, and so we're gonna we're gonna kind of start off with this concept of the abstract art. And you can see that hashtag in the middle, can't you? Yeah, I can see it. And I know you're going to quiz me on this one. Last time I should have taken a look. It's always, I'm always <laughs> just on, on edge waiting. I was like, what? I'm, I'm prepared this time. I'm like, what am I seeing here? Yeah, so you see the hashtag. And that's good, right? Yeah, yeah, I got those. I got the etchings. Okay, so I'm not going to test you on this one, okay? I'm going to take you a step further. But... um. I, I wrote a few chapters around this, this so-called abstract art, and for one thing, it's not abstract art, <laughs> okay? And this image, by the way, is about the size of two hands. So maybe a little, about the size of a piece of eight and a half, 11 piece of paper. So we're gonna actually jump to a, the next slide, and we can see a mare. We can see a horse. I'm right in the middle of the image. And uh, the artists use the, the hashtag lines to create part of the horse, but have other lines in it to find um, the features. Now, what's interesting about this horse is kind of has a leaping look, but more interesting is look at that face. Look at that muzzle. Um, this is not a happy horse. Um, it's kind of an anger. And so we're gonna go jump, we're gonna jump back a slide to compare what we, we've just seen to make sure it's not a figment of imagination. Okay. 
Okay, so you can just kind of see the outline of the horse. Yeah. And we're gonna jump back again. Boom. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Okay, so millions of people are in the popular science and the major journals had seen this image. It was covered in Smithsonian, National Geographic. Everybody covered this image as the abstract art of Neanderthals. Um, it's not abstract art and it's not of Neanderthals. And we can, I can tell you it's not of the Neanderthals because there are other characters in this panel, many other characters actually. It's, it's, it's a zoo, just like that gallery of discs. What's more so extraordinary about this image is to get, compared to the gallery of discs, which was 10 meters across, this is the size of a piece of paper. And it has just about the same thing in it, just on a much smaller scale. And this horse is really cool, this horse. We, if we look to the top of that image, we can find these two characters, face, backs, um, sort of a Janus figure, heads joint. And one ha the one to your, the viewer's right, has kind of a homo sapiens look. He's bearded on the bottom. He kind of looks like you a little bit. I mean, yeah, he actually does look like you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he's homo sapiens. This is a person that could be living in uh, Western North Africa today or anywhere in Europe or the, um, the Middle East. He has that look about him, whereas the other character, it's unclear. I mean, it could be Neanderthal, it could be a, myth, a mythic character, I can't say what it is. But I'm pretty darn sure that this character, to the viewer's right, is a homo sapiens. So think about this. The archaeologists who worked on this Gora Metching for many years, they found the hashtag and they, they, you know, they went to the press, first abstract art of Neanderthals, they're really excited. And they missed the forest through the trees. They missed the much bigger story is you have now the oldest image is Homo sapien. And this man with the beard. And he appears to have his hair, hair shaved just like you, Matt. <laughs> yeah, pretty identical. <laughs> it's pretty identical. This guy looks just like you. Um, and of course, the, the horse, which wouldn't have meant as interesting because um, the horse is the most common character in Paleolithic art. But there's a fascinating image up there on the top. So th these, this Janus figure is about the size of your thumbnail, or maybe just a little larger. Um, but it's, it's, it's incredible. And when the, the Greeks, the Phoenicians had been to this cave and they left um, artifacts of, of homage. And so there was always a question of what were they giving homage to? Well, they probably saw these images and said, this is absolutely incredible, incredible. it's a lost technology. The Greeks had probably been there as well as the Romans and everybody else. As, as well going to the other caves. And they looked at these and they said, this is absolutely amazing. And this site at Gibraltar is um, at the Rock of Gibraltar, just nearby the Rock, Rock of Gibraltar. So this is gonna be one of the pillars of Hercules. So Hercules on his journey goes, of course, crosses the Strait of Gibraltar at the, at the cave, at this area. He also enters a cave. And maybe this was the cave he entered. The ancient Phoenicians celebrated or worshiped Hercules as a god and had many temples built to him. But this is not the key image that, um, so this is kind of like a, kind of, you know, kind of interesting. But this is not what drew me into Picasso. This is the, this, these are the characters, if you look to the viewers far left, these are the characters that drew me into Picasso. You have these two characters, one on the top kind of looks doggish, um, kind of like a, maybe Snoopy, okay? <laughs> kind of a Snoopy look. And down to the, just below him, that character, we have this mythic creature. It's not real. It represents nothing that we, we, we can recognize in the natural world. It's not cryptic. It's not something that you know, was lost tens of thousands of years ago. This is something that we can't imagine. So in this particular image, we flipped the gore matching upside down. Okay? That's how we can see this. And by the way, the gore etching sits on the table about a foot high off the rock, the, the base rock. So the artist could have actually moved around it. We're gonna do a little close up on that char these characters. So I looked at this image and I said to myself, you know, this, this falls into the category of a monster. I mean, it really does. Um, it, it's not something that we, you know, something goes bump in the night. Um, so, something that's in our dreams. And so I, I was already working this pair with the cave images and I had the gallery disc and I had this, this general theme. And I said to myself, you know, if we have monsters, images of monsters at this time, and perhaps even the time of the Greeks, we have the images of the, the three-headed dog and, and so on, and the centaur, which we found in the Gower of Discs. But this is like truly monstrous. This is not a mix between two animals. This is something, um, you know, 
I don't want to say evil, but this is, this is, this is not the person, this is not the character you want to meet in the night. So I said, well, you know, what's the, what is the, the juncture point between these Paleolithic images and the monsters that we have in the movies today? You know, where, where did that, where did that art happen? And I went through the literature of ancient, of ancient art and I really couldn't find anything like this. Okay. I found three headed dogs and, you know, things that we found in the gallery of discs, um, morphing of therianthropes, the morphing of human and animals. So I, I contacted a friend of mine, um, Luther, Luther Kelly Hall, he's an artist, and I'd done some work with him in the past. And I asked him, you know, to your knowledge, what is the earliest uh, works of uh, monsters in art? Um, and he said, you know, you know, there was the scream, which is, you know, really a psychic imagination or psychic scene. But he said, you know, really the earliest scenes of, of art or of, of uh, monsters in art came with Picasso which isn't that long ago, it's just over 100 years ago. And the scene is this, the painting is this, it's called Les Demoiselles de Avignon in 1907, the young ladies of the avenue, so they're prostitutes. And if we look at to the, to the viewer's right, we have two characters with masks. And we kind of take a, we take a moment to just like glare at those for, for a moment. But we see those masks and the masks are different from the other characters. And there, there's other forms in here, that um, are, are slightly different than, than, than um, the art of the past. There's a lot of Cezanne influence in this image, but truly the difference is those masks. So before this, people didn't have gross characters across their face. So we're gonna, we're gonna move forward through this and learn about these masks. But before I go there, when, when this Les Dames d'Avignol came out, it was highly controversial. And one of Picasso's friends, um, um, actually an art historian called the, the rupture point, the rupture moment of the art from the past and the art of the future. So there's nothing before, before there was nothing like this and, and um, everything followed was afterwards. But one of his good friends, Andre Durain said to Picasso, uh, said about Picasso, one day we shall find Pablo has hanged himself behind his great canvas. Because this was so extraordinary, so unique, that people were astounded, but they were also aghast. Um, it's, you know, you know, remember the first Alien movie came out and the, the creature, you know, pop, it pops out of her stomach, right? <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's classic. <laughs> and that was classic. And, and we, it, we, were, we were aghast, right? And, you know, but that became common as we went forward. And so this, this image, these masks and laid down, Les Dames d'Avignon became classic as they went forward, or this concept of putting masks or distorting human characters. Um, well, we can go back to look at Picasso's notes and his studies. In 1907, this is a study, and we can see those same two characters don't have the masks. They have human-like faces. Fundamentally, everything else about the image is the same, but he, they don't have those masks. So where do the masks come from? Well, there's another study of like, the so, year before that, and Picasso's playing with the eyes idea of the mask. And this looks closely like the mask of the, one of the two characters. Art historians say that it came from Negro art, I mean African art. Um, and Genius Picasso series that just aired on National Geographic has him walking through this museum of African art and being inspired by them and drawing the spirits from the, the mass and coming out to him, himself to say that this is where I found it all. But Picasso said when he's interviewed that he definitely didn't get it from African art, that the African art pieces or the mass were there at the time and they were influential and it was kind of the thing they were searching for, but it wasn't where they found the art. So the art historians say, well, Picasso was a liar. Okay. You know, maybe he was, maybe he wasn't, but he wasn't lying about this. Picasso was pretty darn definite. And then they said, where, where did you get your inspiration? And Picasso would say, you know, um, if I, I'm not going to tell you, this is my secret. And of course, Picasso wasn't an academic. He wasn't uh, obligated to um, footnote everything he did. Um, he was a businessman and he was looking for something edgy. And the, these masks, what became edgy. Well, we're going to look at other masks as they compare to Les Dames d'Avignon in the Altamira cave of, of Spain. And we can look at the, to the one to the view is far right. 
is exactly the same as the lower mask in Les Dames d'Avignon, and the one to the, the viewer's left is exactly the same as the one, um, the one above. And if we look at the start with the one above, we can see that the, the masks in the Altamira cave have this like mascara look around them that Picasso used as actual mascara. And if, if you look to the, to the viewer's right of that same mask, that shadow Picasso makes into the, the hair. And so as he would have had a candle, he would seen the same shadow we're seeing with this photograph. And if we go down to the bottom of that mask, you can see that, that mouth, that um, odd mouth, which Picasso also characterizes. Okay. And then the nose, of course, has that, um, that odd shape to it. Okay. So these were natural formations in the, in the rock that the Paleolithic artists took out some charcoal and enhanced. So the, the, the Paleolithic artists saw a sort of, um, the image of horses, most likely horses, um, mares, and then he, he enhanced them. When we look at the bottom image itself, which is even more extraordinary, if you try to find the mouth of the, find the mouth, it's kind of to the, to the viewer's left of the, of the nose, that odd looking mouth to the side, um, is exactly the same as the mouth on the character in Les Dames d'Avignon, in the lower character. So the mouth is, when you don't realize, when you see Les Dames d'Avignon, you can see that, that little circular mouth in the bottom character, and then you can find it again in the Altamira cave. I didn't recognize that as the mouth until I saw it in Picasso's painting. Do you see it? Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> okay, so it's, the, it's, it's like a little oblong circle. Yep. Okay, and it's the same, you can find that same oblong circle just below the, that um, star-shaped nose, because they both have that odd star-shaped nose. Um, and so Picasso had been to these caves, and he was, also, he was often quoted, and I'll give some, a few quotes later, but Picasso had been to these caves, and he drew inspiration from them. He just didn't say that, he just didn't pull these, these characters from the past. He said that these mayors from the past are equivalent to the mayors in the, among the prostitutes, these, these, these females. So he, he also drew the metaphors of the characters. What's really interesting is Antonio Banderas paid, played Picasso in Genius, in Genius Picasso, but he also played the, 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 um, the discoverer of the Altamira cave in the movie Altamira. <laughs> so, so he had the intersection with both movies. And at the end of the Altamira movie, there's a quote about, from Picasso about we have learned nothing um, from the caves. Whereas art historians are... Um, and archaeologists have really struggled with this idea of where did Picasso get the idea from because they hadn't made this connection. Okay. And at the, the, one of the quotes from Picasso, and I believe this one at the end of the movie, was after Altamira, all is decadence, meaning that we haven't, um, we haven't learned very much, that everything else is just icing on the cake. Um, and it, when he came out of the Lascaux cave in France, he was quoted as saying, we have invented nothing new. Now, these quotes were never... You know, they weren't recorded. Um, they were, you know, they, they, the things he set off the cuff to people that ended up in the newspapers and ultimately National Geographic and other places. And many um, archaeologists and art historians have actually questioned whether he went to the caves and if he even had these quotes. Um, so the question we have to, if we, we can determine that he went to Altamira now because we can see that he actually borrowed the actual characters, which became his, his first works of art. It's actually not his first works of art, the first works of modern art and cubism. We can go to another cave in France. This one's from about 25,000 years ago. It's called Grotte de Père non Père. And um, we can see this um, shamanic character. He's wearing a mask. He's wearing a, a vulture mask. He's got these huge gangly hands, which is the same character that Picasso uses it for his curtain design for a play. Now, what he does, what Picasso does, he changes, he changes the, the mask or the character, um, the avianoid, this bird command character in the, in the play. It's not an eagle and it's not a vulture. It's somewhere in, in the middle. So Picasso changed the, the structure of the, the, the mask. It's the, what bird it could be. Um, he creates a completely mythic character, but he drew itself. He drew it from this vulture. And you can see how the vulture mask would have sat over the head of the, the shaman in this image. So he's transformed into the, 
into the vulture. And remember in the, in the gallery of dist image, we found that the character, the shaman had um, taken on the, the personality and ultimately the mask of the golden eagle. And that helps them to transform to, into the cosmos, to become one with, with everything that is. So Picasso had borrowed, he had been to Grote de Père non Père as well, which is much closer to the Paris where he was living at the time. Um, and Grote de Père non Père was actually fairly, it's a very fa fairly famous image um, because there's two horses. And if we look at the, the, the archaeologist's interpretation, you can see those two horses and they both look backwards over their shoulders. And there's two, and so two, one, there's two, one, the two, two horses are stacked above each other. Yeah. And we can find that same horse in the, in this, you can see it in the original image. You can see one of the two horses fairly easily. So if we go back, this is, now we're going to, we're going to do a little um, evaluation at this time. And we're going to go back a slide. We're going to go back a slide. So now we can see that in this slide, we can see the, the bird man, right? with the mask over his head, with the bearded vulture guy. Okay. So we're gonna take a look at that in the next slide. Can you still see it? Make my screen a little bit bigger. Okay. I'm trying to find them. I can- Okay, so we're gonna go back a slide again. Okay. So kind of get it in your mind and you can see how he does it with the, he uses the natural rock and then he marks it out. Okay, ready? We're gonna go to the next slide. There, uh, well, I'm looking at the drawing, and there's so much. Oh, so skip stuff the drawing. The skip the drawing. Skip. Don't look at the drawing now. All oh, you gotta look, look at, is the. So okay, gotcha. the <laughs> so that's that's the, that we're going to talk about. So next, so we're going to we're going to compare the bird man here that we have Bernie's marked lines over to the ones that the original one where we don't Bernie doesn't have marked lines. So you can still see the bird man and see the lines. Yeah. Okay. Now then go look at the, ar the archaeologist's interpretation. Do you see any of those lines? Yeah, I think so. You can see a few of them. You can see the legs of the bird man, but you can't see the beaked head. You can't see those long ganglia, that, lo that big hand. So the archaeologist, he found an awful lot of um, characters in, in that panel that I don't see, but somehow he misses this bird man. So why does he miss the bird man? It's an interesting thing, interesting concept. How did he miss these natural, both the natural, um, ch you know, changes, of, um, natural structure of the rock, as well as the lines that were that were drawn over it. Um, so even if even if you decide, well, it's not a bird man, it's not a vulture, he still didn't put in the lines. So what 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 happened was you have you have an archaeologist that he drew his own impression or he formed his own conclusions what were on the images and that's what came to be science or history. So we have to be very careful about what we, we take as the truth. This is somebody else's interpretation of the truth. Whereas uh, Picasso went into the caves and he drew his own version of the truth and he found the Birdman of course, of course. Well, Picasso had something to say about this and how these, these images could actually come to be. And he, he wrote that, actually, he was quoted as saying, it occurred to man to create his own images. It's because he discovered them in the world around him, almost formed, already within his grasp. He saw them in a bone, in the irregular surfaces of cavern walls, in a piece of wood. One might suggest a woman, another a bison. Now, does that sound what we, we've seen in these past images? Yeah, yeah based on interpretation. And when I was looking super close, I, you know, I saw a flamingo and my mind just started to pick all these different things. And I saw my own version of a bird man. It was, it was fascinating. Sure. Yeah. So Picasso, he, he, he start, he believed that art itself was first seen in the rocks as natural formations. And then man um, enhanced upon that, which is what the images that we've been seeing. And especially in the case of the two masks of the women that ended up in Le Dame d'Avignon, as far as we can tell, there was no structural changes to the rock by the, the Paleolithic artist. He used charcoal to enhance the eyes and the mouth and so on. So we're going to take, this is um, another one of Picasso's famous images, Still Life with Candle and Palette. 
And we're going to look at something quite interesting in this. Uh, and a technique that we found in the Paleolithic art. In the Paleolithic art, you, 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 there, there are characters um, engraved upon other characters, on top of other characters. And, and in the, the gallery disc image, which we spoke about last time, when you have when your character is engraved on top of the characters, you could end up with the body of a man and with the, bot, with the um, tail of a dolphin. Okay. Or well, the man becomes one with the horse and becomes the, the centaur. In this particular image, you can look at the, the head of that bolt. And there's, there's two animals in there. One is superimposed over the other. The ear of a bull doesn't go straight up, which you see on one side of the face. The ear of a bull goes outwards, as you see on the other side of the face of this bull. The eyes of the bull are kind of towards, kind of towards the center, whereas the eyes of a horse are to the side. So what we're looking at here is Picasso has transposed a horse over a bull to make them one. And we're going to, re, we're going to see more of these later. So he's saying there's two characters in this. This isn't just, um, this just isn't a bull. There's more than one character within that, that head. And we will see more of that in a moment. Um, but again, we can look at, go back and look at this Paleolithic image. We can see that, ev so my, my interpretation as well as, as the, the good Abbey's interpretation, we can see the, the layering of these characters over each other. And I believe that Picasso found that, that concept um, in these images. And I recently went to, I saw the solo Star Wars movie. And in the solo Star Wars movie, you have this, well, actually the, the placard, when you, when you first go in, you have the, you have the hero solo, and then you have the, um, the, the female character next to him. And behind them, you have characters as well that are silhouetted or are superimposed into the background. So this, we, and those, those characters, you know, the evil characters, of course, the larger one in the background looms over the hero and the hero is, of course, you know, standing with a, a lightsaber or a ray gun or that sort of stuff. Well, that fundamental style and art that we find in movies today goes back to the Paleolithic because it didn't exist before Picasso in modern times. That we, we superimpose characters on top of each other. So computer art as you have on your own, your own web page and you, you, as, you uh, use as um, banners for your videos is a Paleolithic art style. Um, that we bar that Picasso transformed from a deep in time. Well, let's look at where other other animals or characters Picasso might have borrowed from the past. This is the to the viewers left. We see the mayor from Guernica. Guernica is one of the most famous paintings of all time, and it's it's considered to be um, it's um, the quint quint quintessential modern art. Um, and we're going to go f look at a new interpretation of Guernica as we go through these slides. We can compare that Guernica horse. Uh, that mare with the one in Les Dames d'Av in, in Grote de Père d'Ampère. So you have this horse looking back across its shoulder. You have the, the barred, the strong chest. You can look at the knotted legs. There's a lot of similarities between these two. So it wasn't exact lift, but it's definitely a, a, a style. Now Picasso had this horse that we see at the mare in Guernica. Prior to Guernica, he didn't have this horse. So it just sort of popped out of nowhere. Picasso wasn't making horses like this before Guernica. And we can look at the, the entire panel of Guernica on this stamp. But, and Guernica is, is not just famous because of the style of the modern art, but it was a study of humanity and of, of modern war. And Picasso, this, the image is about the, the struggle between the, um, the party, the people in France against the, the fascist Franco, General Lucien Franco, who had taken over the, co the country after a democratically elected election. Um, and, but, and, but the story is that the Spanish people are being caught between the, the, the Soviets on one side and Franco, who has aligned himself with Mussolini and Hitler on the other. Um, and that's in, 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 this, in the scene, the, in Guernica, the um, Hitler and Mussolini, they use their weapons of war on a civilian population that, um, they, you know, they were very independent population of independent people, the Basques, Basques but they really had no interest in, um, in, in, in Franco's war. And they used, um, they strafed the, the, the market with machine guns and they dropped bombs on the town. And this is a completely civilian town. Um, and it was, the, it was what to become of modern war going forwards. And 
all sides did a lot of bombing on civilian populations. And this was the scene of, of, um, of Guernica. When we kind of look at this, Picasso has made studies for everything. So he kept notes and when we kind of look at the, the animals as it goes through these characters. And we kind of, we don't really see that horse, do we? As he moves through these studies. And kind of the third one to the viewers right on the top is kind of interesting. He has one horse on top of the other, which kind of looks at that growth, the pair non pair of the stacking of the horse. So he has his two types of horses. And, uh, but we can go through this and we can see the, the characters as he has, as he formulated them in his mind. And of course, we don't have that central horse. Um, well, the horse arrives somewhere between the first state, which we see at the top on May 11th and June 4th. And just um, sometime in late May, Picasso disappears for a week. So he's, he's almost finished with this painting. He could, could have been done within two or three days. And he just takes off. And some people say he went to see Marie Therese, his girlfriend who he had a child with, that he, he was, he was um, hanging with Dora Marr, the photographer who was um, is the love of his life at the time, or he had gone back to visit his wife. So he was a man of many women who kept him on his toes and also in some sort of emotional conflict. But we can see that the horse isn't there in, this, in the States. And so somehow this horse, this horse arrives. Now let's also look at the, the bull, the bull to the viewer's top, the far left, and we can see it kind of looks like an actual bull, okay? Then we look to the bull below that, he's changed it, just like the one we saw with the, the bull and the palette, that he's put the, really put that big eye and he's changed the, the ear so that it looks like a horse is overlapping a bull. And we're gonna look at that one a little further as we go through this. But in the broader picture, you can see that Picasso, between this time period, starts to superimpose his characters. He's found a new inspiration. He's gone beyond the story of just this struggle within the town of Guernica. He's, he's, he's superimposing another image over it, or another scene from a distant time. Now let's go back and look, look at that horse, or the top of the bull. And we can see the horse's ear, um, we can see the horse's eye, and the horse's mouth to the side. And that contrasts with the bull's mouth and the bull's, he puts the bull's eye kind of in the middle. Um, but he has, he has superimposed one character over the other, which is a style that he uses with the bull in many paintings going forwards. On the bottom of the panel, let's go all the way down to the bottom. And, and the, the hero has fallen and his left arm is stretched out. And that's a glove. And the story is that Picasso used the, the glove from Dora Mar that he, when he first met her, she was playing like Russian roulette with a glove or a knife in her hands. Um, that there was another glove he found that had been um, burnt up and had this, was defigured. But if you really look at this, this, this glove, it's a dog. And you can see the two dog ears as I mark them, they're sticking up. Um, and you can see the nose, the muzzle of the dog, and the mouth. So Picasso has superimposed a dog into these characters, into this character of his hand. And as we go up, we can look at that. There's a, there's, a, there's a woman who's wailing and just holding her child. But something unusual about this child is that the, the legs of the child are too short, okay? And the body is too long, okay? Well, if we look at the, let's consider this from another perspective. What if the two, the two legs there are actually a mustache and the triangle lower body is a wide nose? And just above those, the two fingers that are coming from the mother become eyes. So perhaps Picasso transferred people in his world, the metaphors, into the actual characters. And in the top, the, Picasso said that the horse in the center of the image were the Spanish people. So if we're on, the, we're on this side of the image, perhaps the, um, the bull becomes Franco, the horse becomes who, who symbol the Spanish of Spain. Um, the horse then becomes Mussolini. And then this other character is one we won't mention who it might be because Picasso didn't want it to be mentioned. All he wanted, to, he wanted to say that these people were responsible for the horror. And this one person with this, this uh, wide nose and mustache was responsible for the death of an innocent child. And so we can, we can ponder later on who that character might be. And at the top of the image, we, we find the bull with the, the flaming tail. Um, Franco said that he was willing to um, burn half of Spain to keep out communism. 
So it was one of his things. And, um, and so let's go back and look at that still life of the bull. We can see the superimposing again of the horse over the head of the bull. So some people would say that, well, Picasso's characters are monstrous, but they're not really monstrous. He's doing the superimposing technique as he found in the Paleolithic images that we can see now. Let's go back and look at Guernica. So if we find, if, if, in, if in fact, as it's not just in Bernie's imagination that there's a left and there's a right, and so the viewer's, the viewer's left is really the right of the image politically, okay, from if you're within, this, within the stage. So if, if, um, if a Mussolini and um, General Franco are on the far right and the other unmentionable is below them, then what might be on the far left? from the inside. Well, one would think it would be um, Stalin and the Russian bear. So let's look at, let's kind of look a closer look at this particular image. And we have this woman screaming out of a, out of a, out of, it looks like a barrel. And the woman has the profile of his wife, Olga, who was Russian. Um, and she, she actually, she, and she was very theatrical like that. So he, so he perhaps he sets up a Russian character within um, this, perceivable barrel. But let's look again how Picasso is an actual barrel. Off, it looks like a big arm is coming off that barrel. And out of that arm, we see either it could be claws or teeth. But they're certainly not, certainly not a barrel. Okay? So Picasso might be saying that the, um, he's describing this as the bear. And that's the, either the arm of the bear or the, or the teeth of the bear or the claws of the bear. And if you look into the center part of that barrel, you can actually see the head or the face. It's actually the face of a bear. It's just the, the face, just the face. He superimposes. It's very slight that he puts it over it, but it's in there. It's a little tricky to see, and it might be something to go back and look at later, but he, he takes the same superimposing technique that he doesn't have it in the earlier, um, his drafts as states. So he starts with images on top of each other. And so what he does is he's created this political scene. He has the Spanish people in the middle as, as the struggling mayor and the hero has fallen. And on one side, he has the, the Russian bear with his wife, Soviet wife, Olga, screaming. On the other side, he has the, um, he has the right Franco and Mussolini and the, the unmentionable below them who is, who is responsible for the, the innocent child, the death of the innocent child. And let's go back and look at this. Um, something other in interesting about this and the co this concept of superimposing images on top of each other. In the center of the image, you can see a, you can see two lights. You can see an electric right light dead in the center on the ceiling, and just to next to that, you see someone holding a lamp. Why would you need a lamp and an electric light? And I would suggest that the lamp bearer is actually the lamp that takes him into the cave itself. So the, the kerosene lamp. And then he's superimposing that image of the cave over an actual scene in Guernica where he has an electric lamp. So Picasso is layering images on top of each other in the same that way that we go to a movie today and we see the, you know, we see Solo in the front as the hero and the, the damsel next to him and behind him we see the, 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 the silhouette or, um, of, the, of the villain who shadows over them. And I believe that Picasso does the same thing with this. And it's, a, it's a, a technique that he found in the Paleolithic images that you just don't ha have to put a horse in the image and someone holding the reins of a horse and another person admiring the horse is that you can pile metaphors on top of each other and characters. And people, people may not fully understand what's going on. They can, they can look at it and they can say, this is the, the horror of Guernica. And slowly in their minds, they can figure this stuff out. Um, but it's a, um, so Picasso's genius was that he took um, a concept from the past of the metaphors and the, and the, and the overlaying, and he carried that into, into modern art, which is fairly common everywhere you look, including your own webpage, you find this, this style. And so we, we can bear homage to the Paleolithic artists. So we, I said I had these two other, we had two images earlier from the Altamira cave and someone could say, well, you know, maybe those are two offs and so on. Well, in that same, in that same chamber, we have another one. <laughs> okay. And if you tilt it 90 degrees, um, you can find it. It's the same character as he has in night fishing at Antibes. Um, and he used the charcoal in the back becomes the hair for the, for the character. Um, 
And if, if I had a photograph of the, you know, you know, exact profile, this Alex mirror cave image, it would, it would be identical, but we can see, we can see the patterns. What, what Picasso, what was the connection between the two with night fishing? Um, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't personally see the metaphor as I do with the other ones. Those other characters we've seen, but again, so Picasso had, we can now, so on a scale of one to 10 with Picasso definitely been there to, to 10 definitely been there and one, you know, just maybe, where do you stand now, Matt? One uh, to well, 10. Fr from all of them, like at least the, 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 I think it was the second one that you showed. It was, it was super obvious because there was an arm going through where it made no sense. So that would make it a nine or 10 for sure. <laughs> okay. For <laughs> random, unless somebody gave him a photo. Um, but yeah, I think it was the second one. I was like, it, I can see the comparison very clearly. Yeah. So Picasso had been to the caves. Um, so we, in this presentation today, we're rewriting history. We're, we're telling a new version of, um, of who we are and where we come from. Now, Picasso was known as having monstrous art. Um, and in this particular image, we have um, the, the, the yellow sweater, the woman, she has two eyes disjointed from each other, um, and her nose is slightly offset. Well, let's, if we look at this from the perspective, Look at this from this perspective of well, Picasso is just creating freaky art, then it's freaky art. But maybe Picasso, the same technique that we found with the, ho the horse superimposed over the bull, we have are actually two personalities, which is the same technique that we found with the Janus figure in the early from the Pelican Cave. You had the faces um, in opposite directions. So Picasso might have seen Im these images and said to himself, Well, you know, I can create two personalities within one character just as we found with the Janus figure and we found with the horse within the bull. In this case, it's probably the same individual and she has two kind of one side, she has two different looks about her as well, two different uh, states of feeling in this image. Well, this concept of the, I believe that Picasso started with Janus type figures. And so early on 1931, we can actually see this character. Um, you have two faces that are kind of in a globe. Um, and it's, you know, kind of a Janus figure and one is there in blue and the other is, is white. So we're looking to the viewers far right to the top, right. We see the kind of the male characters and we could say that those are two different personalities because I mean, they're clearly not the, the same, you know, it's, it's not, if I took a photo of you, it wouldn't look like that even in profile. So he's created these two different personalities. Um, these might be two different individuals, but it's certain, at least, um, it's not one personality. So we can see that Picasso starts with a Janus type of figure, which is again, an, a, a character we find in a Paleolithic record from 36,000 years ago at the Gorham Cave. Here again, we find the sailor, the same type of technique from Picasso as he has. In fact, this looks a lot like the, um, the horse over the bull with the eyes, how he does it. And he's, he's tell, I believe he's telling us that there's, there's, there's two, there's two people within th these characters. And Picasso did a lot of women, um, a lot of women characters or the women of his life as these, these two headed, you know, we could call them monsters if we wanted to. Um, and Dora Maar was quite popular because she was, um, she was nuts. I mean, she was clinically nuts. Um, and however they called it back then, I don't know, but she was clinically nuts. And um, so he would have seen these, these, these tremendous, um, differences in her personality. Um, and here, here we find seated nude in an armchair in 1965. And if you look at the face, it, he, he again does this, um, this kind of Janus thing, except the faces are, are next to each other. So we're really, there's one in profile and there's one that actually overlaps it again. Um, and is this a, a man and a woman? I'm not a man or woman, I'm not really sure. Um, but so Picasso, he, he, he keeps innovating on it. He keeps adding, metaphors and perhaps in the right hand it's holding the ankh or something um the, the egyptian symbol but picasso keeps playing with this idea of overlapping characters transposing them um picasso was um a very proud person he was in no way humble um he was considered to be pompous and arrogant and all that sort of stuff but i, I believe that picasso recognize where his inspiration was coming from. He just didn't want to tell anybody because then it kind of blew his story. He had this, 
he had this edge, he had this creative technique. And if he said, well, you know, I just borrowed from the cave art, people are like, oh, he just borrowed from the cave art. He's not really the genius that we thought he was. So Picasso said that it's not sufficient to know an artist's work. It's also necessary to know when he did them, why, how, under what circumstances. Someday there will be undoubtedly be a science. It will be called the science of man, which will seek to learn more about man in general through the study of creative man. I often think about such a science, and I want to leave to posterity a documentation that will be as complete as possible. That's why I put a date on everything I do. And so we can, we've, through these images, we've gone back through the history of Picasso, and we can see um, his transition of artistic styles. And we can even see through his studies where, he fa where um, his evolution and then we can kind of, you know, consider where he might have been at those times. And there's no record, we have no record of anybody, um, Picasso didn't drive, he had a driver. Um, so someone must have been taking Picasso, you know, he had a confidant that drove him to these caves. He certainly didn't take any of his wives or his girlfriends because they would have ratted out on him, okay? Um, they, they would have had something on him. Um, he also did much of his work at nighttime. So people, if he, ha if he was working off notes, Nighttime when the love of his lives were actually sleeping um, and there was nobody else in the studio. So if he actually had these images that he was working off of, no one would have known how, that he was doing them. But Picasso thought about these images and he, he, he's, he's talking about the science of man, which is really the science of psychology um, and or, or also maybe anthropology as well. And so Picasso, in, his, in these images of the two-headed people and the two-headed animals, he's talking about different personalities within the one. Um, and he, trans and he takes from Altamira the mass of these horses and transposes them onto the women, the prostitutes in the brothel on the, or on the street. And he's, this is about psychology. This is about the mind of man. This is about the mind of Picasso and has how he saw the world. And he believed that someday people will look back at these images just as we are doing right now. Um, and they'll be asking these, these questions that he asked. And he, he pondered that he never had the answers for, but how he, he, um, he articulated them was through his art. So was Picasso a genius? As, as the serious genius Picasso says. And that is a question for the master, Matt Belair. Was Picasso a genius? I don't, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know enough about him. You're supposed to tell me. No, no. <laughs> so you, you just take this journey and where we are now. Do you, now, what do you think about Picasso? Well, you know, I didn't know much about him to begin with. So the way that I'm receiving this, it, it looks like a little bit of uh, mysticism. You know, mm -hmm. if he were to go to that cave, right, you know, you don't reveal your trick then sure. has the courage to come out and do something totally unique. And it is 100% genius because, as you, as you said, um, nothing like this had ever been done before. So to me, when you do something brand new, unique, and then, uh, you know, culturally it gets picked up because there's, there's weight to it, there's significance mm -hmm. to it, that's genius enough for me. And I would, I would go with that as well. Because with Picasso, so it had been done before, but he did it in a modern sense that he transposed – the genius of the distant past um, to a new to a new time and place, um, and Gernicker, of course, is the the pinnacle of this. That he transposed the these warring animals from the past. So the you know the bull the bulls fight with each other and the, the mares and you know the life of of animals in the so called wild and natural environment isn't really fun. They're constantly sparring with each other. And so he took that same scene from the natural world and the personalities of these characters and he transposed them over the, the villains and the heroes of his own time. Um, and the victims of his own, and the victims of his own time as well. So that I, I believe that Picasso was a genius, but not for the reasons that, um, you know, traditional art historians believe him to be. Um, and... You know, I, I, it's fascinating to look back at Picasso. And when I, when I was working, I was about half, halfway through the, the development of the Before Ryan fight in the face of the hero when I stumbled across Picasso and these images. And I said, wow, this is the connection that everybody could make. Because everybody, we've all seen Guernica. I mean, whether or not we remember it or we've all seen Guernica. It is the most um, famous modern art there is. 
And now we can, we can look at Guernicker within the minds of Picasso as well as the Paleolithic artists and we can find something about ourselves. And that's something about ourselves that we found was that um, Picasso saw the, the rage, he saw the human, the raging bull in the human. He saw the stallion, the promiscuous stallion in the human. He saw the mare, which, which, um, which um, leads the herd and um, gives life as the central character in Guernica. He, found, he saw the, the avinoid, the shamanic character within the within, um, grow to pair, non pair. And that same, shaman, that same shamanic character is what transcends us or transcended people um, in the past to you know, another, um, another life or another reality, just as people in more modern times or Abrahamic times saw through angels. It's a very similar concept. Um, or the Anunnaki when Bab and the Babylonians had, they had the same character. We go Native Americans. We had shamanic characters with who wore the mass of birds to transform themselves. Um, and so Picasso, he he had the the insight to be able to see these, and he transformed these characters from the past to our present, and they help us to understand not just what was in his mind, but they help us understand who we are and where we come from and where we're going to go. And I believe that these, these archetypal characters, these metaphors within us, whether it be the raging bull or the, or the, the lead mare, the promiscuous stallion or the protective mother bear, which is of course the Russian bear, um, that the, these characters, these metaphors, these archetypal um, characters are within us. We can't escape from them. And so we, we still identify ourselves as a, a raging bull or a bull in a china shop or smart as an owl um, we, we, um, or you know, fly me as a lizard or something like that. Um, we, still, we still characterize ourselves as these with these archetypal characters just as people did in the past. And I don't believe that we'll ever escape from them because they're somehow part of us and they probably go deeper than just a, ourselves as humans because animals within themselves you ever you ever heard of horses there's a hierarchy with the, with the lead mare being at the top um, and then there's younger fe there's Jew, there's let's say less not do the not dominant females follow her um, and so there's um, there's hierarchies and archetypes characters within horses themselves as well as other animal beings and so we, we carry this somehow in our DNA that we have the ability to recognize these personality types which allow um, animals, all animals, to find hierarchies so they're not killing each other all the time. And that the, there's societies within ants, um, just as there's societies within horses and societies within people. And I believe that Picasso saw this, and that's what he carried through him in his art to our modern time. And so genius Picasso, I'm going to give him a thumbs up. Bernie, that was awesome, man. And has anybody else made a correlation between Paleolithic cave art and Picasso before? No. Wow. No. So people have made the quote that Picasso bent from Altamira and Lascaux, but no one had actually made the connection with these cave images. Wow. So potentially that could be his main inspiration for bringing all of his art. And that's potentially it was. For you. Yeah. It was. The pivotal moment was when he borrowed those masks from Altamira Mm. And put them in Les Dames de Avignon. That was that was the rupture point in modern art and modern society and all the art that you see today. Amazing. It. It's, Amazing. Yeah, the, and you know, it's um it's been there, and I believe that other people had seen this. I believe that um the Abbey who missed that we saw with the um who did the the pair non pair, I believe he saw the bird man. And but there was, you know, did he really want to come forward that there's a bird man, that, that we have these Abrahamic angelic characters back that far in time? And the answer is probably no. Um, so were we ready in, in the 19, you know, 1930s, 1940s for all this? Well, Picasso was ready for it, and he, he fed it to us through his art. But maybe we really weren't ready to, for this concept that, you know, we're reliving a past where, through these archetypal characters. And there's really nothing new under the sun. Wow. And that's a wrap. That's amazing. <laughs> Bernie, that was an awesome dude. Round two is just as good as round one. Um, 
you know, before I let you go, I want to just thank you for the presentation, for the research and uh, everything that you're doing. Is there anything um, else that you wanted to share about Picasso, about your work, about, you know, I know your book, everybody liked the, the round one with the, uh, with uh, before Orion. So is there anything else that you'd like to share before we head out? Well, this is before Orion as well, all this Picasso work. And the webpage is beforeorion.com. I'm on Twitter at Bernie Taylor OR. Facebook is before Orion. Instagram is before Orion. I use hashtag before Orion on everything. And YouTube, um, one word spelled out before Orion.com. Um, and people can, you know, look at the images themselves and they can um, explore what they see and what understandings that they come to. Awesome. And that's about, thank you. Uh, well, I was going to ask one question. So if someone's going to explore the images that you have in your book and these, like, do you have any advice for them? Like how they explore the images, look at it just to kind of, to get the information, like a, a context or a spirit of exploration. Um, I would say one thing is open your eyes to what's possible and not just what people have told you. Because everything I've done so far in, in both these presentations would be considered original work in our time. And if I had gone down the path of, well, if this wasn't already published somewhere else or peer reviewed or whatever the story is, um, I couldn't have gone this far. So we really need to, we have tremendous um, possibilities within ourselves when we break from the paradigms to reach in a, you know, further in our own directions that we see. That's what I'm talking about, Bernie. <laughs> Amazing clothes. I appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for coming on again and sharing this work. We'll definitely be in touch. And uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, I'm sure this is going to spark some more stuff and people going deeper on Picasso and uh, the cave art. So thank you very much. Have a great day. See you later. Bye.